Okay, welcome everybody to this thesis theatre. I'm Dr. Sarah Brown, and I am delighted to present to you this evening, Nadia Schaefer, who's going to tell you all about the work that they've been doing on Lord of the Rings and focusing in on various things to do with, well, Legolas and one strange self. So the first thing I'm going to ask Nadia to do is just to introduce herself to you. And Nadia, could you just let the folks here know a little bit about you, your signum journey, that sort of thing? Sure. Uh, well, my name is Nadia Schaefer. Um, I know that most of you in this uh, thing know me because I looked at your names and most of you are related to me. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I am a grad student at Signum. Um, I started in January 2019, I believe. So I've done the vast majority of my degree during the pandemic. And it has been a hoot. I've had a great time. Um, and for the last eight or so months, I've been driving everyone in my life nuts with Legolas and Lord of the Rings. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about my research about deep ecology, decolonization, and about Legolas. So I have a long slideshow for you that... I have to admit, when I ran through this earlier today, it was very long. <laughs> it was too long for anybody to sit through. So there's going to be some slides where we're just going to skip those slides. We can say hi to those slides. And then later on the recording, if you want, you can pause during that bit and see what on earth was happening. Um, so it's looking OK with the slide. You can see. Looks okay. good to me. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So. This is my master's thesis, uh, One Strange Self, uh, Deep Ecology, Decolonization, and the Radical Hope of Legolas Greenleaf. I uh, want to start this off uh, as a land and territorial acknowledgement. The thesis is written and now being presented to you on the Haldeman Track, which is a parcel of land that rests on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples. Um, all three of which will be variously points mentioned in my thesis. So try to remember those names. Um, as you can see from this map here, it, what is the Haldeman track in red? And the, that orangey bit is the bit that actually is being under the, the, the care of the First Nations people in our area. So a few definitions before we get started, um, just because I'm gonna start talking and then it's not gonna make any sense. Uh, what I'm talking about for decolonization. So this is the undoing of colonization through discovery, reclamation, recovery, and the uplifting of peoples who have suffered under imperialism. Uh, deep ecology, I will define a little bit further a little bit later, but it's essentially an ecological framework that rejects the separation of the self from the natural world and focuses on the interconnection of the self and the natural world. Related to that as well are sort of three kin terms. Um, there are different just ways of understanding it. Uh, ecological self is sort of a philosophical understanding of one's place in the natural world, where those spaces overlap, where they intersect. Interbeing is essentially the Buddhist version of that, uh, where the self is inseparable from nature. Related to that is uh, right relation or right relations. Uh, this is a conceptual model that we use here on, on Turtle Island. Not every indigenous group uses it, but it's very commonplace where it's sort of I looking at uh, relationality and reciprocity between humans and their non-human relatives. Sometimes you hear this expressed in the phrase, all my relations. Sort of a cousin to that is uh, Donna Haraway's work, where she has the phrase making odd kin, which is solidarity, allyship, and friendship with the unexpected. So I'll use the phrase odd kin quite a few times. And when I'm saying Turtle Island, I mean North America, as defined by some real, um, indigenous peoples of the continent. Uh, this is a contemporary term that's an act of resistance, decolonization, reclamation of indigenous stories and place names. I tend to go back and forth when I'm talking about it academically, uh, but that's partly to lull you into getting used to hearing that as a term. So um, this is what the flow of my thesis on paper looks like. This is just so if you're at home and you're wondering how long am I gonna keep talking for? <laughs> Give you like, okay, we've checked off these things. We're fine now. Uh, so turtle, talking on Turtle Island, ancestors, awakening of the self, honoring pain for the world for my distress of Nimrodel. Those will all make sense as we keep going, hopefully. So first, why are we reading Tolkien on Turtle Island? Let's make that depressing thing go away. Um, essentially, what happened was I was going to write a lovely thesis about robots. And about two weeks before the deadline was for submitting your thesis topic, the UN climate report came out. And also during that pit, 
there was more stuff with residential schools and COVID was hitting a new wave. Um, and actually this tweet came into my life, which was, I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. LMAO said Gandalf, well, it has. And that really resonated with me of like, okay, maybe what I need right now is to go back to Lord of the Rings and see this book that means a lot to me, what I can take from this during this time period. And so I went to my buddy Legolas. Um, Legolas, I joke, my boy, is the beginning of my academic career for Tolkien studies um, because I briefly became Tumblr famous by making a random post very tiredly one night. Um, but sort of talking about uh, Legolas as just sort of being this underwritten character that people can put a lot of things into, but there's already so much there in the text. So using Legolas because he has all these identities that we're gonna explore, he seemed like the right way to go. Uh, and we have Orlando Bloom there pretending, talking about how he would just play him as a background character, which is the only reference you'll have to the movies today, I promise you. So looking at Legolas as a Sylvan elf, I wanted to understand um, Legolas from a post-colonial perspective. And again, that's sort of the tie in with decolonization, looking at how colonialism and imperialism have affected certain places and how life goes on afterwards. So when we're looking at the Sylvan elves, there is a huge line of argument that I don't wanna get into about what does a post-colonial examination of that mean? Um, essentially, there's a huge spectrum of arguments about what Tolkien as a white writer living in the time period he did, what he was talking about. So we, I say that there's a huge spectrum. There's the one spectrum where, end of the spectrum where he is twirling his mustache evilly as he's trying to tell us about how the British empire is the best thing that's ever happened for the world, which I mean, it is not, probably true by any other scholar who's like, I having read any of the things, no, that, that's not true. But we'll say that is the one extreme. And the other extreme being that he was very purposely, metatextually perspective, he was writing these things in order to convey what these people thought about these people. And really, you know, he's thinking like six layers ahead, which may be true, but is sort of the extreme example of that. Um, I tend to lean more towards that area, but because post-colonialism and Tolkien is such a huge thing, I just wanted to acknowledge this. We're leaning towards metatextual, um, but we're not putting any value judgments in. We're not going to explore any of that. Um, as I joked in my paper, the author is not dead necessarily, but he has sailed into the West. So let's talk about the Sylvan Elves and the people of Turtle Island. Um, I'm just gonna go through this very quickly uh, because there is, sorry, I'm just making sure that we're not doing this forever. Um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Uh, as I said before, jokingly, this is gonna be recorded. So if you need to, you can go back, pause, read the slide. But essentially we're looking at, there are lots of different indicators that the Sylvan Elves have markers of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And I am being that vague purposely not in an idea of that every single person is the same. All these people are the same. It's sort of what's looking at this realistically of what information would be coming to him, what information he has, what um, his basis is going into it. So if we look at these things, it's not so much an indicator of they represent every single indigenous people, sort of like, well, what does Tolkien understand of indigenous culture and indigenous peoples in North America? Um, so there's this love of Westerns. Um, there's this idea of the Sylvan Elves being skilled trackers. There's some language stuff in regards to whether or not they had written language before the Sindar reappeared. Um, to everything from how they described Gollum uh, as a creature that sounds very much like a Wendigo, and even the fact that they have black squirrels, which are native to the, the region of the peoples I'm talking about specifically. So there's lots of little things here and there where it's it's not difficult at all to make that connection. So I wanna also, because of that, I wanna consider the origins of the Woodland Realm. Um, there's not a lot of information about the exact founding. 
So according to Unfinished Tales, um, before Orifer shows up in Mirkwood, the Sylvan Elves are separate, small scattered peoples, and the reunification with the Sindar led them to become more ordered. And as I, I joke here with my, my little gif, that that's very boring. That's very, it's very tropey. It's, it, it seems unlike Tolkien to just not have come up with something. So I wanna introduce uh, the background of one particular group, the Haudenosaunee. So the group of six nations, so five nations when it started, is sort of a, a, a history that might be helpful to look at. So this is uh, one of the world's earliest participatory democracies that's still going on today. When I showed you specifically um, that map, that little orange spot, uh, that's six nations right now. And that's a, a seat of power for these folks. So essentially in the origin of this um, democracy is this idea of five groups coming together. Um, and they are brought together under this idea of peace that as a council, they would make decisions together. They would have this group. Um, but according to the legend, the person who first um, ran this group, the first leader, is a, an evil warlord, a, a, a dark wizard. And he has essentially um, the, the evilness combed out of him, combed snakes from his hair. So the idea is, is this a person who comes back to the right way of living, the right way of being, and that is the person who goes and becomes the leader. And so this is brought as an alternative perspective because what if it's Orifor who is becoming the king of this new nation because his group was the furthest away from that right way of living. This is this person who has come back to the correct way of living. Um, and when that works with the text as well, as we see in the nature of Middle Earth, um, this is this group coming back home instead of this small group imposing their culture on everybody. Um, and, and this is important as well when we're looking at its contemporary Lorien. Um, so there's really two big takeaways I want you to take from this. And this is the idea of guardianship and of wisdom. So when you look at background text in uh, Nature of Middle Earth and Unfinished Tales, there is a lot of repetition of the words uh, guardian, wisdom, wise, etc., And that's often used as a indicator of power. So we have Galadriel referred to often as wisdom and that she had wisdom that the Sylvan po folk didn't have. And it was okay when Amleroth was king because he had wisdom. But when he was gone, then it was okay for Galadriel and Celeborn to come in and be rulers. But then again, as guardians, which is a very interesting term for Tolkien to pick specifically guardian, as he's a big fan of stewardship as a model of governments, of people who are there in place of king, but with the understanding that this person will step down. And guardian is a very different word. And what it's interesting in post-colonial studies is that guardian often is used in legal documents regarding colonial states and their obligations to indigenous peoples. For instance, um, in the Indian Act, which is still being used in Canada, the word guardian shows up a lot as explaining the state's role. So I, I wanted to quote uh, Jess Battis there, which is essentially that Galadriel is not a benign force in this text. She, she is deployed in the game of control and this machinery of colonization. These same markers are there for what this history of Lorien looks like. Um, sorry. This is another thing too, I, I didn't mention before. I use a lot of fan art because I find it really interesting to see how people react to things and I, uh, of how people very glibly can pass information on. So I want to talk about the Battle of Deglorath. So we're looking at the Second Age is ending, Third Age is about to start, because we want to see Legolas, the time period he was born. So we learned at this battle, when we're talking about wisdom again, it's the idea that the two major leaders at this time were irresponsible for not putting their people under the control of another leader, of the Sindar leader. Yes, doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, a, not a Sylvan leader. But because of that, it was their fault that they suffered huge casualty losses. 
So it's really interesting when I brought this little piece of fan art out, it was more of just how people reacted to this, of this idea that, oh, because they were so independent, they, they lost their lives, doesn't really make a huge amount of sense. And because of that, I was bringing it, there was uh, a fairly large parallel here between the Sylvans and the indigenous peoples of Canada specifically serving World War I, but we don't have time, so we're going to skip that. Please review that later for recording. But this is all to say, when Legolas is born, what the Sylvan nations look like at the beginning of the Third Age. The woodland realm um, of the people who have gone to battle, about a third of them have come back, ish. So his father, Sandu, oh, I cannot talk today. The other thing is I'm a little dyslexic and a little hard of hearing, so I mispronounce everything at the wazoo and I very apologize for that. Um, friend, duel. I can't talk today. Doesn't matter. I'm getting the good. Yes, I said, said it right. He established his community in the far northeast. It's fortress, it's underground tunnels, because his peoples do not want to be involved with the rest of Middle Earth. And they think that Mortar at some point is going to come back and be an issue. So they want to be ready. Um, and, and also important at this point is that the Sindar have effectively integrated into Sylvan society. So Legolas's identity at this point is entirely Sylvan. While he does have that Sindar and history, he only refers to himself as Sylvan. Um, so this is sort of the one approach to this colonization of that essentially we have a new culture that has come about. On the other hand with Lorien, um, it has lost about 50% of its soldiers um, and it falls to the rule of Amroth. Um, he personally lives in a sim similar manner to the Sylvan Elves, but the majority of the population is Sindar. Um, the Sylvan town, according to, it does depends on the text, is either a dead or a minority language. So at this point, this realm has, has gone completely almost the other way. There we go. Um, I am going to mention this only briefly because it ties into the end. But essentially, what was really interesting um, recently when Nature of Middle Earth came out, that we had different ideas of what Amroth was as a person and what Nimrodel, um, his love interest, was as a person. So when we're looking at this, we have this love story of these two different cultures trying to make that work, um, but there being this, this underlying issue of culture and of race between the two of them. And what's interesting for Unfinished Tales, for a very long time, we had that she loved him, but it, it was hard for her to be with him because she regretted the, the others coming and bringing war and destroying peace. But then in this new version, we have a, a version of that. It was not requited love. She could not love him. She did not love these people. And it's also interesting that this is the version in which uh, Sylvan is a minority language, not a dead language. And so there's these small nuances as well that I want you to bring up just for when we're looking at a post-colonial argument of that Tolkien is writing from two different perspectives at two different points of his life. And what does that mean? And also different editors for these different sections. What things are they pulling out? What things are valid and considered right? So it's just something to keep in mind as we're gonna go forward um, as well. We're looking at uh, Nimrodel. So Legolas sings a song of hers that he uh, admits that he doesn't remember all the words to and his very long and very sad is essentially what he says. But I wanted to pull out a few sections. Um, specifically what's important going forward is this idea of unexpected hope. So instead of, it is a tragic song about two lost lovers and being taken from each other. But what's interesting in this section is where now she wanders, none can tell, in sunlight or in shade, for lost of you were with Nimrodel and in the mountain strayed. What's interesting in this version that he's singing is that Nimrodel is clearly still alive. And then she, the idea of straying, which is a suggesting a level decision making beyond access, accidental separation. So he's actually having a different version of this story in which there is an element of agency and decision making. But there's also an element that this has not ended tragic. This is not Romeo and Juliet where both people die. This is, this is a different story. So Legolas's depiction is of a lost wanderer instead of this doomed lover, which is I think quite interesting. Um, and so 
wrapping this up quick, uh, Legolas. He's born into a post-colonial world. He's part of a post-war generation. Um, he has a historical and ethnic tie to the Sindar, but he, he identifies as Sylvan. Um, we don't know what the heritage of his mother or grandmother were, so we're not sure to what um, the amount of genetic he is of the different groups, but for him it doesn't matter. He's Sylvan. Um, even Tolkien in his notes refers to his name as uh, a royal name and an originally Cinderin line. So even at that point, he, when Tolkien is writing and coming up with his name, he is writing it from a Sylvan perspective. This is a Sylvan person's name, spelt a Sylvan way. Um, so there's a great argument that I don't have time to get into about the loss of language being a tool of colonialism. So Legolas's name is sort of this sign of resilience. So this was a very specifically picked name for this reason. Um, but it's also because of the compound of it, it's not just his heritage, but also this identification with the forest. Um, so I'm not gonna go into this hugely, but essentially it is that Legolas counts uh, time, he counts perspective and history through the natural passing of the forest he's from. Um, speaking of terms of uh, leaf fall as seasons of the growth and death of trees as being time periods. And essentially nobody else likes Mirkwood. Everybody's uh, descriptions of Mirkwood make it sound like a very unpleasant place to be. And anytime he has a chance to talk about Mirkwood, he, he talks about how lovely it is and how much he loves this place. Um, so this is Legolas coming into the book. And oh, I won't mention this too much because there's sort of the joke I get sometimes of like, why didn't Glorfindel go along with the fellowship? He's right there. It would be so much more useful to have Glorfindel. And the point is, as, as um, Megan and Fontenot says here, it couldn't have been Glorfindel. It had to be somebody who understand the natural world. It had to be someone who speaks for the trees. Um, and here is a, a poster I saw at a protest recently that, that cracked me up to fit with that. So we're gonna talk about deep ecology very briefly again, as uh, this has two main origin points. This is a publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And in the article, the shallow and the deep uh, long range ecology movement. And so again, we've talked about this a little bit, but this is the idea of the nature of the self and where it relates to the natural world. Um, what the relationship is, if it is an overlapping relationship, if we're one and the same, et cetera. Um, through my thesis, I wrote from the perspective more so of Joanna Macy, um, which is her I, I, uh, definition of deep ecology is the realization of our mutual belonging and the living body of the earth, which I, I think is a good enough definition to go forward with at this point. Um, there's a debate about deep ecology with Tolkien, of course, because of the time period that makes it difficult. We cannot just say, yes, he was a deep ecologist. He claimed this in a letter because deep ecology came as a term happened the same year he'd passed away. So that would be difficult. Uh, but there's a few here perspectives about what we can consider um, to be signs that he would agree with deep ecology. And essentially what I would argue is that it, deep ecology is reflected in Lord of the Rings through depictions of relationships between self, between natural world and the places they intersect and overlap. Um, this is generally the idea that when you're going through the text, you can see that people who relate well to nature tend to be the protagonists, the good guys, and people who are destructive to nature are the villains. To make that is the simplest, most boring way to say something beautiful, but there you have it. So when I'm talking before about Legolas as being somebody who's there who can speak for the trees, um, we can see what does it look like for Legolas to speak to the natural world with the natural world. So throughout the text, we can see him speaking to or translating the voices and feelings of various animals, birds, stones, a waterfall, the south wind, trees, horses, and seagulls. And there's other passages where it's clear that he's trying to communicate with other things, but we're not sure if he's actually successful. Um, he admits often when he is not successful, such an awful Florian, where he says that he doesn't have the skill or the emotional capacity to translate at that point. And there's sometimes where he tries things and it doesn't work out. For instance, my favorite 
uh, Legolas passage is when he accidentally falls out of a tree because he's trying to get to know the tree better. And I think that's very sweet. Um, so part of that is the making odd kin. When we're talking about looking at the natural world, that, that means that we're going to have to make relationships that we're not expecting to make. Um, it, it depends on someone's personality. For me, becoming friends with a tree doesn't seem like the most crazy thing in the world. And for someone that does. But when we're looking at making odd kin, it's sort of what are the relationships we're not expecting to make, these partnerships we're not expecting to make. And I will not go into this hugely, um, just if you have a passing familiarity, it's th this relationship between Gimli and Legolas is very important when we're talking about making odd kin. These are two estranged peoples who have a bias against each other, who in contacting with the other and getting to know the other realizes that they are kin, they are not separate from each other. Um, and so I, I have a quote here from Donna Haraway explaining what making odd kin is, and that's we require each other in unexpected collaborations and combinations and hot compost piles. We become with each other or not at all. And so we see this as well. Um, I will not go into this hugely because again, uh, time, but there is a lot of mirroring between the two characters. Um, there's a lot of looking at their relationship as terms of comforting other each other, helping the other one grow, helping lead each other. Um, there's a few biblical references um, that's quoted in their, their speeches back and forth. So Tolkien is doing this quite purposefully to see that these people are echoing each other's language. But essentially it's this unlearning of cultural bias. Um, it's learning about the need for relationship with other peoples and depending on each other as friends and as sort of reflections of each other. Um, I will point out for the fan art for this, uh, that the title of this piece was Aragorn is on the worst hiking trip of his life. And I, I think you should appreciate Aragorn's face in that picture. So we're looking at, at Legolas still making other odd kin, uh, two of which are Arod and Gollum. So Arod is the horse that Gimli and Legolas uh, travel with, particularly. And there's a lot of language of uh, Legolas being very specifically talking to Arrowhead as my friend, naming him my friend. Um, and also parts where they are communicating, they are in conversation with each other, not that is verbal for the audience to hear, but between the two of them. We can see that there's an instance in which Arrowhead is afraid, so Legolas uh, covers his eyes and he sings to him and talks to him. There's a deleted scene from the books that we, we got where he has a conversation with the horses to give them the agency of they can leave whenever they want and come back whenever they want, which is quite sweet. Uh, the other one is uh, an attempt to make a relationship with Gollum. So he, Legolas uses uh, Smeagol as the name for him until he's with other company that uses Gollum, so he changes it. Um, but the really important thing here is that Gollum's escape was due to overkindliness. Um, the wood elves would lead him through the forest and let him to climb trees and enjoy the forest because that's how they would understand wanting to be in the forest, wanting to explore things. But Gollum is actually using this to contact the enemy and this ends very poorly for the elves. But the fact that Legolas chalks this up to overkindliness, that it was sort of, we try to emphasize and make relationship with someone that maybe we shouldn't have this time. And um, that, that is relating throughout the text as well. Um, <laughs> uh, essentially, there's some people who have made an argument that the fact that we don't hear any voices from Mordor is this act of colon colonialization because we're refusing the other a voice. But it also can be used as re a refusal to let evil have a platform to speak. There's three instances of Legolas shooting an agent of Sauron directly through the throat um, as multiple occasions in which he just makes the first shot essentially, to the point that Gimli tells him at one point to literally shoot first. So we had the Han Solo shot first font over there. Um, so it's interesting to see Legolas as this idea of is open communication and open dialogue, but he's also direct action that evil does not get a chance to speak. And in um, the thesis itself, I quoted Jack Kirby of his idea of the only thing with politics is that if a guy liked Hitler, he'd beat the stuffing out of him and that would be it. And I, I feel like that applies very well to Legolas of, um, you know, people from the, Sauron does not get a voice if, if Legolas has any say in it. 
Um, but from that as well, uh, Athelion is uh, Megan and Fontenot and quite a few other people, including Elizabeth King, focus on this idea of that Tolkien never relishes violence. So even people who use violence in this mean of peace usually follow it up with acts of service of community, of creating and restoring what was and making things better even. So we have Athelion at the end, this place, according to Fontenot, where Eowyn, Faramir, and Legolas all end up here because all three of them are people who are very ethical people who had to use violence in order to preserve peace. So it's interesting that uh, I like Elizabeth King's argument here that trauma-related struggle and traumatic stress is never a moral failing in Tolkien's works, but he always shows that the most normal way to respond to your trauma is to turn the suffering of the self towards the service of others. And from there, we're going to go sort of one uh, veer way before we go back to that. And this is really neat to talk about Legolas and Fangorn. Um, I joked when I was writing my notes to myself, and I wish I still had that note that was Fangorn, uh, Legolas loves Fangorn the way I love Godzilla. We're, we're really talking here about um, the mysterious other, uh, the things that are not known, the things that are not understood. So Langlois's relationship with Fangorn is quite interesting and is um, where this paper really started. But it's talking about that Legolas, who he is here to speak for the trees, who understands the natural world is faced with something that he doesn't quite understand. And something that's very ancient, very old, and he wants to understand better. So why I'm gonna go through this section, I'm gonna pull out a few um, passages that were very important in the construction of the thesis. Uh, just talk about them very briefly of why they're pulled out and go on from there. So what is most important from this perspective and what I'm working through is Legolas and the Hurons, Hur <laughs> which I keep, kept typing as Hurons every time in my thesis I prepared. So what are these? These are ants that, or are they ants is the beautiful thing. Uh, so our descriptions that we get of them, there's not many. Uh, we have one from Mary, which essentially that they are ants that are almost like trees. They move very quickly. They move in groups. They move in shadows. Uh, they can speak to ants, but we don't hear their voices. They have become queer and wild and dangerous. Uh, Verlin Flieger has a few really good quotes about herons. But essentially looking at what are they exactly? Are they individuals? Are they a, an aggregate moving mass? They're sort of the surreal picture of the violence in nature, which is, I think, quite cool. Um, so when we look at that as well, what's interesting is this um, really figure says that they are tree fairies defined by their actions, aiding in the process of creation by making effective against the orcs, the divine tree idea. So what is interesting about them is that they're really identified not by their appearance, but what they do in the forest. They're this mysterious agents. They're this embodied version of wrath. They're sort of representatives of the underworld of death. And what's really interesting is that throughout tradition, that sort of character of the tree fairy, the dryad is a very feminine character, but Tolkien makes this this very masculine character. So there's this inherent nuance of queerness with this, with, this, with Legolas's interest in the forest, in this draw. Um, so looking at this, when I'm talking about Tolkien improved queerness, which is a different thing that can go on for about an hour, but I'm gonna summarize very quickly of what I'm talking about when I'm saying this. Um, Nature of Middle Earth, there's two sort of terms and ideas that came out that are sort of relevant to the understanding of Legolas's identity. The one is in deal which is a uh, deep concern for things or objects of thought comparable to the love of men for arts and sciences, but surpassed with them in intensity and affection. And there's a specific term for that for someone who's trees, where sort of what is most important to me in my life is trees. <laughs> it doesn't matter my romantic, my sexual identity, anything of this, trees are the thing for me. The other thing is we have a term now for essentially what is a queer platonic romance or a relationship. 
of these ideas of love brothers or love sisters. These are relationships designed as love between members of the same gender without desire for sex because there's no desire for procreation. And that's, for me at least, reads less as a judgmental thing from Tolkien, or, but more sort of affirming what he states for straight couples as well as with elves is that there is a tendency that once you're finished having children, you're not interested in sex anymore. So it doesn't feel like a hugely out of left field idea. So talking about um, desire, darkness and the end of the world. So we're talking about trees again. So the tree is being this idea of where um, the unconscious mind meets the spiritual, meets these places of rebirth, generation and of death. So the tree itself reaching upwards and the roots below reaching downwards. So Elizabeth Herod had this description of what the tree as the psychic symbol looks like in Lord of the Rings. And we see this passage um, when the tree is hiding the Hurons and possibly the Hurons themselves are described like these axes, lawn sweeping boughs, um, roots like limbs of strange monsters, all covering dark caverns beneath them. Um, sort of this idea of this, this un, not understood uh, darkness that crosses over into death. Um, what's interesting as well, and we're gonna look at this passage in a bit, is that when Legolas sees this, he's very captivated by it. He wants to look at it more. He would have stopped and just been fixated just on this if he didn't have Gimli pushing him along. And this is qualifiers interest is important um, to Herod, as I mentioned briefly before, but this idea of the reflections of each other, that Legolas understands the trees, he understands life, he understands this regeneration, but Gimli is this representative of the underworld. He understands this other reflection of this. Um, so as I said, I'm just gonna go through a few passages very quickly. Um, yes. So essentially when we're looking at the physical experience of Legolas in Fangorn itself, there's a few sort of key aspects. Uh, one is the idea of breathlessness, of being very physically affected in terms of anxiety. So we have that, there's a, a tenseness, there's an anxiety, um, there's the, the air is humid, it's stale. Um, but like a sense is that this could be, this isn't just the forest as it always is, that if he had come when it was in days of peace, he wouldn't be experiencing this as he is experiencing it. Um, so the recognition that his reaction um, and what he is feeling would be very different based on what the forest was feeling at that time. Uh, and as well, looking at that, so we have him talking to Gandalf about the same idea that it, he feels the hot, he feels the wrath around him. He feels air throbbing through his ears. Um, and we have Gandalf confirmed this earlier too, that the forest itself has a long, slow wrath that is brimming over. So Legolas is clearly able to feel this and is being very affected by this. Um, well, what's interesting is that we have him in a similar situation it's a little bit later on, where we're looking at the past of the dead. Um, and this idea that Legolas has shown that he doesn't fear the dead. He doesn't fear ghosts. He doesn't fear anything of this nature. The only time in this scene where he is interacting with the, the horrors of the paths of the dead that he really seems to be upset by is when in the approach state mountain, when they're surrounded by these black trees and dank fir needles. Um, and these match with Haldir's um, a description of Southern Mirkwood. So it, it suggests that Legolas has a tolerance for these conditions, but this place specifically, this idea of this rot and this decay is the thing that is too much for him. He can handle ghosts. He can't handle um, dying trees, for instance. Um, and we have here from the, the Lego Lord of the Rings game. So I guess that's my, my second concession to the movies that is there for you that Gimli is afraid and Legolas is fine. Nadia, can I ask you how much more of the presentation there is? Yeah, that's a good question. What time is it now? Oh, uh, it's yeah. Okay, we're gonna go very, very quickly then. I'm just going to start going through slides one by one by one and then 
like we need to really rest and then we'll wrap do that. It up in a couple of minutes okay okay sorry oh shoot why are you there now okay uh here we go here we go you were on about 37 i think yeah there we go okay past the dead there are eyes in the trees uh legolas wants to see the eyes gimli does not want to see the eyes um, Gimli thinks that the trees want to kill all of them. Legolas assumes that they do not, which is interesting because normally he speaks as if he always knows and always understands things, but he's willing to make a guess for them. Um, so this is a moment of dark apology. It was essentially that you're not looking for the goodness in uh, ecology or for the natural world. You want to know exactly all the, you want to know nature and red and tooth and claw. Like you're not looking for the goodness. So when we have uh, Legolas here, it's not so much that he wants to, to he thinks the Hurons aren't that bad. Um, he knows that they're that bad and he's interested in them. Um, the idea that he's looking forward to the future, um, the idea as well is that he's having existential crisis. I'm so sorry, I did not realize how long I was going on. So I'm just going to start talk wrapping things up essentially if we're going to wrap this up real fast um essentially legolas has seen things that he would not have normally seen um things that he's not expecting and then he gets to make different choices than uh, elves would normally be able to make um that's it <laughs> Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll just, as I said, this is recorded. You're welcome to look at my slides and you're welcome to ask me lots of questions. But I'll leave it on this uh, for question period. Um, this thesis has a playlist. So if you're interested, you can go to see what I was obsessively listening to while I was writing it. And I will stop sharing. And again, I apologize. I did not realize it was 7.40 already. It's okay. Uh, it's so interesting. So, you know, I, I warned you, it's very dense and that's me cutting. <laughs> so much. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to give us that overview of your thesis. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure that uh, the people watching appreciate that as well. Uh, and for anybody who's interested, obviously, um, if you are a member of Signum University, you'll be able to borrow Nadia's thesis out of the Signum library and uh, and have a look at the work that she has been doing uh, and I hope that you will do. Okay so um, we do have a few questions if that's okay. Of course. So um, the first question I'm going to ask you, um, you reference the nature of Middle Earth quite a few times. And of yeah. course, that's a relatively recent publication. So tell me a little bit about how that affected your work, this new publication, which came out partway through when you're actually doing your thesis work. Yeah. Um, it kind of blew it up in the best way possible. Where it was, it was more of a lot of rereading going, I knew it. I knew I was right for various different things. Um, so it was, it was very good at uh, really confirming, but it also, I had to reread it several times because it's, it's very, um, it's very dense, like my thesis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in That's there and it's sort of scattered throughout, math. So I think. There's a lot of math. Know, exactly. A lot of math. Um, so, you know, ask me in two years and I may have even more thoughts on nature of Middle Earth, but mm -hmm. it, it, I was lucky enough that it came out right before my reading period. So it wasn't, you know, six weeks before my paper was due being like, oh no, I've just been proven wrong on everything. But I, I was I was very excited actually at that opportunity to be um, so early at looking at those mm. notes. Mm. And it's clearly informed quite a few of your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another text that you were referencing there was uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Yes. Right. Now, I mean, that was published in 1962. So we're looking at, you know, it's, it's a 60 year old text. Why do you think it still resonates 60 years later? I think just with all of Rachel Carson's writing, it's just, it's so, 
lively and I don't mean that in sort of a weird it's doing a song and dance for you but just sort of like it feels so alive you feel with her writing that you are there in the room with her talking to her even though this text is 60 odd years mm -hmm. and there's so much in it that even if the specifics that she's talking to about of, um, in terms of chemical influence on the environment is very different than it is now but like the sentiment of it is still so important that that message still carries that mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you read that book another 60 years from now, and you're still going to find that same meaning, that same importance in it. Mm. I just, I, I love Rachel Carson, so I'm a little bit biased in thinking that, yeah, that work's going to be important forever. But I, I do think it really shaped, especially a scientific nonfiction, of what that looks like, just even as a field after that book. So kind of like Tolkien's own work, um, it continues yeah. to have meaning for us because, you know, its core message, its core themes are actually eternal, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I, I really got to enjoy rereading it now, again, like uh, in this time period of my life, in this time period of what the world around me looks like. It was, it's interesting to have this text that, you know, mm is closer to a century than not old and it's mm. yes indeed okay so we've got a couple of questions from the audience um one person has asked how often is guardian actually referenced in the text so i don't have the exact number um but essentially it's more in the supporting text as i mm -hmm. said which is what i would call unfinished tales in nature of middle earth where we're looking at things that were not published within Tolkien's lifetime, which was not necessarily going to be published ever. Um, and it's more of, I would say, in my notes at least, I saw it three or four times within a few paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to look up the exact number, but for it to be, you know, if you have a page and a half that's dedicated to a subject and for any word to be used that many times starts you know, raising a flag, especially when it's combined with wisdom, which mm -hmm. is used quite a lot. Um, and is interesting because the only time we hear the Sylvan elves being referred to as wives is, wives is from Gandalf. Mm -hmm. And sort of in Lord of the Rings as somebody who's actually there on the ground living in that world. So yeah, I'm not sure what the exact number is, but um, I, if I would say it'd be like three or four times on a single page. Mm -hmm. Okay, and next question. Uh, from Jane Goddard, who says, you mentioned that it's appropriate that Legolas, Eowyn and Faramir wind up in Ithilien for restoration and healing because they have acted less than ethically. Can you say more about why they require the specific type of healing that Ithilien offers? Sure. Well, Ithilien is, it's very interesting and I wish I had more time to go through it, but I've seen a lot of really interesting work talking about Ithilien as being Two, two different things. One is a reflection of um, those encountering the evil of Mordor and trying to resist it, which is really interesting. But the other one is Athelion being as a force, being as a place, trying to fight back itself as being part of this. So, and it offers this area of respite that when people are traveling through it, they're still seeing this goodness in it. So it's a lot of this area that has the potential to be saved. And a lot of people who are seeing the possibility of that even while everything is on fire. So bringing them to this place where these three people who are very caring, ethical people, very, very strong values have had to commit violence, end up in this place that needs this healing, that needs this attention, needs that love, feels very fitting of that. They had that opportunity to be part of this because it heals themselves as well as this land. Okay, thank you. I hope that answered your question, Jane. Okay, Isaac would like to know, uh, I'm interested in something you didn't get to talk about because of time. If Legolas identifies as Sylvan, rejecting Sindar colonizer identity, what does the decision to sail mean? And with Gimli too, uh, is he still Sylvan if he sails? Or is this part of he is able to do things he would not have been able to if he had not unlearned? Exactly. That, that, the, it's the unlearning. 
Mm -hmm. where on that one of the slides there, there's sort of a, a joking fan thing of the difference between Arwen and Legolas is Arwen is, you know, I'm willing to die because I don't want to live without eternity for you. And Legolas is like, well, we're going to do some breaking and entering into heaven. Let's go. And, and I say this jokingly, but the idea is that because of this unlearning, he's like, oh, this narrative doesn't actually have to be as I think it is. I can kind of just do what I want. All right. So the idea is that because it would be, it's such a, a far stretch based on everything we've seen that Legolas is able to bring Gimli in a boat that he's made over to into the West. It's interesting that we can sort of see that there's a long period of decision-making coming in from that. Okay, a comment, uh, comment from Isaac in the, uh, the comment box it says, I love every comic and meme that involves <laughs> Legolas smuggling Gimli in his luggage. Yes, I've, I've, my favorite is over referred to as he smuggles it in like some Twizzlers at the movie theater. It was my, <laughs> my favorite expression I've seen of that. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly uh, you've been doing a really intensive read of The Lord of the Rings, uh, right down to, you know, minutiae of language. Um, how has that affected your enjoyment of the text? I thought I would, well, I was worried I would hate this book at the end. I'd be like, I am so sick of this book. <laughs> and I was saying to my spouse a few days ago that, you know, it, it's been sitting by my chair for whenever I think, okay, I need to double check something. And it occurred to me, I was going to have to put the book back on the shelf. And I wasn't emotionally ready to do that. I'm like, it just sits on my end table by my chair. It can't go back on the shelf. So I didn't realize like how even more fond of it I was to like even the physical copy of it. I'm just like, but this has been my friend for the last eight months. So mm -hmm. it's, it's nice that I've had the opposite reaction of, yeah, I love this even more now. So in some ways, it's just revealed more layers of the text for you. Yeah, exactly. And it'll be fun to, uh, you know, give it some time. But then this is the first time I've ever let myself write in a book because I thought, OK, I'm going to make notes. I bought a copy specifically for writing in and mm -hmm. I'm going to be intrigued to see what I've underlined, you know, a couple of years from now. Mm -hmm. So a packed thesis with lots of ideas in it. But what sort of things did you have to cut out for time and space? that you really wanted to pursue, but you couldn't? Well, I mean, you, you, you saw my flash forward of, I think 15 slides was the last 30 seconds of that. And that was the stuff that was in the thesis. I know, and that was the things that were in the thesis. And there's stuff even in the thesis that didn't make it into the presentation. There were so many different ways to go, but basically it was sort of that there is a lot of eco-criticism to do with, with Tolkien in general, but, but even just in Lord of the Rings. And it was fascinating where I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I'd like to go in that direction. Nope, got to pull back. So I'm, I'm excited just in general with Lord of the Rings and ecology, but like there's so much for decolonial work. It's just the possibilities of it is fantastic. It's just more of, I ended up doing like a sampler platter of all these different things that... Mm -hmm basically almost every section. Oh I, oh, I wish I could go back and expand that, but I'm not gonna do that for a master's thesis. So is this particularly the time for an examination of Tolkien's work through the lens of ecology, through the lens of decolonization? Is, is this the time to do that? I think so, but I think that there's been many times where it's been appropriate. I feel mm -hmm. like it's a lot of what people bring to the book that they get out of it. But I think, especially right now, because I, I think I've been thinking about relationships and that connections between people as much, especially during the pandemic, because we've been very isolated from each other and mm -hmm. we spent a lot more time in nature for quite a few of us. So it has been this time of like, you have, you're looking for these connections, you're looking for meanings, you're looking at how on earth do we get through this? Mm -hmm. And you have a text that says, yeah, this is what it's like living in the darkest timeline. And this is how it ends. It's going to end fairly well. I mean, you're all going to be traumatized, but mm -hmm. uh, it'll be okay. You're going to get through it. And I mm -hmm. think that's, that's really helpful and really hopeful. Good. So given that this is a really good time to be talking about these particular topics, 
And given that you had to cut a whole load of stuff out of your thesis um, <laughs> because of certain word limits, etc., yes. um, where would you like to take your work in future? I mean, you've you've completed your master's thesis now. Yeah. That's yeah. done. That's a piece of work that is complete. But what are you going to do next? Where are you going to take this? I think I would like to do more deep ecology work with Tolkien. Mm -hmm. I think specifically that. Um, though, I mean, honestly, I, I like Legolas. I, I think I could see myself fleshing out where because this is specifically about Legolas. There's other stuff in there too. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, just because there's not a huge amount of scholarship with him. And I, I get that. He doesn't, he doesn't get as many lines as most people. But I, I think really looking at deep ecology, because I did not realize how good a fit it was. Mm -hmm. I, I, it didn't occur to me and it should have due to my love of Rachel Carson, but just, <laughs> I think there's so much there to still explore and to look into. And I think that's something that's only going to kind of come more, more relevant with time. Mm -hmm. So are we talking conference papers? Or <laughs> I don't know. This yeah. is what I was going to joke. My mom in the chat's going to be like, when are you getting your PhD, Nadia? Um, I, I'm are you not sure. PhD, Nadia? <laughs> I, I told my my beloved spouse who has put me th helped me through all of this that I would take a few months off at the very least. I, I said originally a year, but I know me and I am a workaholic. But yeah, it may, it may be PhD, but I also might just be independent scholarship of just, mm -hmm. I've had an interesting thought. Now mm -hmm. all of you have to deal with it. <laughs> Sorry, I just <laughs> said you said a year <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to try. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I will be continuing doing academic work, whether that's just doing things independently or doing my PhD. We'll have to see. Well, there's plenty of conferences out there that would be looking for papers on such uh, apposite topics. So, you know, um, and it's a good way of building towards doing the PhD, of course, testing out the ideas in a, a conference setting. Exactly. Exactly. Mm hmm. <laughs> Takako's chuckling to herself in the chat there. <laughs> okay, so here you are at the end of your master's thesis journey. In fact, at the end of your Signum master's study journey. Although, of course, yeah. please do come back and uh, <laughs> audit some courses, you know, when you've got the time and the energy to do that. Um, it's a long and arduous journey the master's degree, it take, you know, it demands a lot of our students. Yeah. So do you have any advice for future master's students with Signum? Um, take your time. Don't feel like you need to speed through it. I, mm -hmm. I did notice that there were times in which I thought, oh, well, I'm going to have to take like three classes or whatever to catch up on my timeline. And then you just wore yourself out and you're not actually enjoying mm. what you're you're learning and so when I had semesters where I only had one or two classes I could really focus I I loved it like my last semester was just the Ursula K. Le Guin class and I could just be obsessive about Ursula K. Le Guin for four months and I adored it so just mm -hmm. you know take it nice and slow just enjoy it mm -hmm. you know, enjoy these are the nerdiest people on the planet enjoy your time with them <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, you know, the Signum family is not close to you simply because you will be graduating next yes. summer. That's for sure. Uh, Jane Goddard is saying we'd love to have you at Sunshine Moot. Oh, well, I, I will. I will consider that. <laughs> well, plenty of opportunities just with Signum to be testing out your work at the uh, the various regional moots. So, mm -hmm. yes, yes, that would be fantastic. Uh, I don't think there are any more questions from the panel. So I'm just going to invite the panel to join me in congratulating you, Nadia, on a job well done. You worked very hard and you deserve passing with honours your oh, master's okay. degree. So congratulations, I'm Thank delighted you. for you um yeah. really it's been a joy to work with you and uh, thank you for bringing me along with you on this well, well thank you thank you so much I, I I really appreciate it and and thank you to everybody giving me congratulations I, I I really appreciate it that's that's quite a way to end a master's degree I really appreciate that 
Okay, so round of applause for Nadia. And there, yep, lots of applause coming in the chat for you. So Nadia, the next time we speak will probably be when I am presenting you to the Signum family when you graduate next summer. That's wild, but that's that's wonderful. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see how long my, my year my, my year off goes. Maybe I'll still be off by that point. That will be good. <laughs> Maybe. And when I say speak, I mean, actually speak. Yes, yes, I, I, I understand. There will be emails <laughs> in between, but yes, yes. Uh, I look forward to attending some of your papers in uh, future conferences. That sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to thank everybody who has come to support Nadia for her thesis theatre today. Really appreciate you coming along and showing your support and asking questions and cheering her on in the chat. Uh, it's always lovely when uh, the, the students are able to bring along friends and family as well as members of the student body. So thank you very much for attending. And that's everything from us. So Thank you again for coming to this thesis theatre and I hope to see some of you again at a future thesis theatre. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.